Reuters, Vietnam culls 1.2 million pigs as African swine fever spreads nationwide. Vietnam has culled more than 1.2 million farm pigs infected with African swine fever, the government said. Pork accounts for three quarters of the total meat consumption in Vietnam, a country of 95 million people where most of its 30 million farm-raised pigs are consumed domestically. The virus was first detected in Vietnam in February and has spread to 29 provinces, including Dong Nai, which supplies around 40% of the pork consumed in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam's southern economic hub. That's uh, yeah. bad. That <laughs> scary. is bad. On last week's episode, we talked about how hard African swine flu has already hit China. Here's a report on how China is dealing with pork sh- shortages due to African swine flu. Actually, I lost that report. <laughs> Never mind. I don't know how I lose that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Uh, this is really worrisome. We're still watching it, of course. So it hasn't jumped to the U.S. as of yet, but... And also, to make up for the oh. shortfall in supply, China is turning to imports, including pork from the United States, despite heavy tariffs imposed amid the current trade dispute. In the first two- that is one of the most interesting yes. parts. I love that he said that. He brought this, up the trade dispute yeah. and the tariffs. I love it. Yeah, and we, we mentioned this last week too, how Tyson stands to gain from this. So yep. Do you have more clip? I sure do. All right weeks of april alone it bought over a hundred thousand tons of u.s pork and that's almost 20 times more than purchased in the same period last year in total u.s pork sales to china are predicted to hit a record 2.2 million tons this year and that's in spite of those import tariffs that now stand at 62 percent china's diminishing hog herd is also threatening the pharmaceutical market the widely used blood thinner, heparin, is made from pig intestines, nearly 80% of which are typically supplied by China. Authorities uh-uh. say a global shortage of the drug could result. Meanwhile, many countries, including the United States, are taking extra precautions with live swine and meat imports in an effort to stop the African swine fever outbreak from becoming a global pandemic. It's... <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I'm it's sure. It's getting scary for pork. Yeah. And pork production. And I didn't realize it was used in that. Yeah, vaccine. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of worrisome, yeah. but I'm sure we'll continue to keep an eye on this situation. Yep. You know any information? Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com or tweet us. <laughs> healthy yeah, talk Healthy show, Talk Show, drop, drop the, the W. w. Or Instagram. Sorry, I couldn't remember if that was the right term. Like, tweet us? Is uh, that what it's called? Yeah, tweet us. <laughs> I don't know. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> good morning, America. New study looking at where... Ult- what? Good morning, America. New study looking at what ultra-processed foods can do to our waistline. Just to be clear, explain what ultra-processed foods are. So they're the foods, a lot of them, that are right in front of us. Chips, candy, white bread, even some breakfast cereals. They are typically very high in fat, salt, and sugar. They are what we call nutrient-poor and calorie-dense. And basically, they're the things that we buy in the grocery store that can be stored in our pantry long shelf life. Basically, they can withstand a nuclear holocaust, and they're not good for us. Probably not good for us. Yeah, that's yeah. True. Uh, here's a little brief study, 30 seconds. This was a very, very important study funded by the National Institute very, very of Health. Important. It was very small. Very small. small. But incredibly good methodology. Very Incredibly good methodology. Very well controlled. They followed people in direct observation over a four-week period of time. They matched them calorie for calorie, and they found that the group that ate ultra-processed food gained a pound a week and they were hungrier, they ate more. So again, if, you, if they're eating the same amount of calories, there's something in these foods that really mm, changes our kind body's of hormones, the way we some eat, things, and it's a problem. All right, what did she misstate? Because she, she should have clarified that they were presented with the same calories, mm-hmm. but they were uh, free to eat as much as they wanted. So they were kind of seeing like who filled up first and who like mm. ultimately ended up consuming the most calories. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have more clips? Nope, that's okay. it. So I'll I'll go on to my other mm-hmm. criticisms. So what she should have said is they were being matched for calories and then also macronutrients. So they're trying to match for sugar, fat, fiber as well. Uh, but they admitted, while we attempted to match several nutritional parameters between the diets, the ultra-processed versus unprocessed meals dif- differed substantially in the proportion of 
added to total sugar, insoluble to total fiber, saturated to total fat, and omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids. So, you know, not it's not perfectly matched in all the macronutrients. Yeah. Mean, probably because these processed foods have less fiber, they're going to have more uh, fat or sugars. Mm. Um, and then the length of the study was also fairly short. Yeah, and then... Four weeks. She wasn't joking when she said small. It was mm -hmm. 20 participants. Oh, yeah, that's really small. Yeah, and then, so you're correct. They did the four weeks, mm -hmm. so they would have one group. They would they would start with the processed diet. The other half would do the unprocessed diet, and then they would kind of swap. But, you know, weight can kind of fluctuate, so we don't really see the long-term effects of these diets. Although, you know, I don't think anyone is arguing that processed foods are good for you. Yeah. I don't. Well, <laughs> unless maybe the manufacturers. Yeah. But, you know, they, they didn't look at calories because it is also calories in versus calories out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's just that if you eat unprocessed foods, you tend to fill up probably due to the extra fiber, and then that prevents you from overeating. Mm. Um, something that they didn't really address, but they did kind of imply so they mentioned the cost of these ingredients so that it was the cost to prepare 2,000 calories a day was estimated to be 106 for the unprocessed versus 100, or sorry, 100 versus the processed versus 151 for the unprocessed. So eating the unprocessed was more expensive. So that goes back to what people, you know, usually argue that mm -hmm. poor people end up eating this faster uh, more processed, bad for you, fast food. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of difficult. It's difficult. What about soylent? You know, some people are saying that those protein powders are not good for you. Yeah? Yeah, that the long-term health effects may be detrimental. Because I remember the argument from our guest Genesis on soylent and the way he lives is because it takes, it's less for the body to break down because it's already processed. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. There's some contradictory studies, so. I don't know. We may have to do a deep dive. Maybe. Or let us know. Ask com. Maybe. Or maybe I'll do an experiment myself. CBS Philly. Philly soda tax study sees cells dip. Public health um, impact unclear. 83 million fewer cans of sugary soda sold in Philadelphia one year after the tax was added to sweetened beverages. That's according to a new study from Penn Medicine. Really great news for public health. Christine Roberto was part of the research team at Penn. Health outcomes were not measured specifically in the new study, but she says sweetened drinks have contributed to the obesity epidemic and several other health problems like heart disease and diabetes. Sweetened beverage tax in Philadelphia led to a 51% drop in tax beverage sales in the city, but we see that some people did cross the city line to buy those drinks and avoid the tax, about 13%. It ends up being a 38% drop in soda sales from nearly 300 supermarkets in and around Philadelphia. 13% left the town to, to go buy soda elsewhere. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> what opponent, uh, what an opponent says. The soda tax has generated more than $130 million for free preschool programs in the city, but opponents say the tax has had a negative economic impact. A statement from the American Beverage Association says, in part, this latest study verifies why a majority of Philadelphians want this tax repealed. It has caused punishing price hikes that have hurt working families and sent shoppers to stores out outside the city. As a result, we've seen local businesses close and employees lose jobs. Taxes on common grocery items like beverages have never really improved public health. Very dramatic, and they yeah. respond. But the Penn researchers say they found no change in unemployment claims impacted by the soda tax. The Penn research published by the Journal of the American Medical Association today was funded by Michael Bloomberg's charity, which supports anti-obesity measures, including soda taxes. Jessica and Yuki? They support soda taxes. That's yeah. one of their, <laughs> their main bushes there, soda That's taxes. It's number two bullet point on the website. Yeah. But it's, we were talked about this earlier, too, how the consumption rates had dropped before mm -hmm. the tax even went into place. Yeah, so. that was in San Francisco, I believe, that study was done. Yeah. I think in the Bay Area somewhere. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> Yeah, whether this tax was even really effective or mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, and I like that too, that they were going to the border. Yeah, to get... It's pretty funny. Going to another town to get their soda fix untaxed. Hey. Breaking the law. You know, educate people, but, you know, let yeah. people do what they want to do. Let people it's, do it's it. their body. Yep. <laughs> CBS Evening News. New study suggests that women's breast cancer risk can decline by diet. Women who followed a balanced, low-fat diet had a 21% lower risk of death from breast cancer and a 15% lower risk of death from any cause compared to women not on a low-fat diet. We actually have information that is hardcore. Dr. Donna Marie Manassi is chief of breast surgery at Maimonides Medical Center. You have to decrease your fatty intake if you actively want to be positively affecting your survival from this disease. It's almost like a license to give, us, to give a prescription now to see, a, to see a nutritionist and to change your diet. The 20-year study followed nearly 49,000 postmenopausal women who did not have breast cancer when they enrolled. One group adopted a lower-fat diet with daily servings of fruits, vegetables, and grains and cut fat intake to about 25% of total calories. The control group continued their normal diet, with fat accounting for about a third of total calories. The study suggests that dietary changes don't have to be drastic to have a lasting impact. Dr. Taryn Arula, CBS News, New York. Very good. Yeah. Anything on that? Uh, yeah, back to eating I, healthy. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think we're surprised. Just more yep. reasons to eat, be, eat healthy. Yep. Avoid cancer. At least try to. Yep. You want to talk about some intermittent fasting? Let's hear it. Cynthia is a Western medicine trained nurse practitioner and functional nutritionist who is passionate about female hormonal health. She believes that the inherent power of food and nutrition can be the greatest asset to your health and wellness journey. She did a TEDx. Eating all day long overtaxes our pancreas and our digestive system. It overtaxes it so much that it cannot work properly. And if it cannot work properly, we cannot absorb our food or the nutrients in that food. Another really important distinction when it comes to meal frequency or how frequently we're eating is the debate over sugar burners versus fat burners. And I've never heard about this debate. Yeah, but I haven't either. It probably is a debate. <laughs> when we're talking about that, a sugar burner is someone that, that consumes lots of carbohydrates and taps into glucose as their primary fuel source, which is incredibly inefficient. If you recognize these individuals, they are frequently hungry, they often get hangry, they have significant, yes, significant dips in their energy level, they struggle more with fat loss and they struggle more with their weight because insulin levels are high. Insulin level or insulin is that fat storing hormone. So if levels remain high, we have more oxidative stress, we have more infl excuse me, inflammation, and we struggle more with weight gain. It makes so far yeah. it's the case against eating all day, a little bit more. In sharp contrast to this are fat burners. They tap into fat stores for energy. They have sustained energy. They are much more clear cognitively. They don't get hangry. They are easy, it's easier for them to lose weight because they tap into those fat stores. They sleep better and they age more slowly. So meal timing and how frequently we are eating is absolutely crucial. That's intermittent fasting. Yeah, I'm not sure about the age slowly thing. Because <laughs> the only thing I've ever heard of is calorie restriction with respect to longevity. And I, we mm. talked about that with Genesis. So. Oh. Swag Lord in the chat, I never get hangry. Is it just me? Do you ever get angry in general? Or do you ever get hungry? <laughs> well, you know, that's the other thing about hangry because I definitely get hangry, but I notice with our diets now that we kind of eat less carbs, mm -hmm. but we also eat more frequently. So that's yes. also why See, we that's don't... why I like this because intermittent fasting is telling you not to eat. It's supposed to eat during daylight hours. Oh, and she explains it. We'll get yeah. into it. But I we eat every hour. Yeah, but we also eat. Yeah. Just like a small like carrots or Yeah. Okay, continue on. Let's talk about intermittent fasting. It is the absence of food during a prescribed time period. You exist either in a fed Hold the phone. Why is there somebody texting in the bottom the left corner right oh, there? Man. Look. Oh, Paul, what man. the heck is going on? He's right in the camera texting. 
during a prescribed time. Oh, zoom and enhance. I want to see. I want to see what that yeah. person's doing. Zoom Auto and enhance. enhance. Auto times, enhance. Times 200. Period. Jeez. You exist either in a fed or a fasted state. I'm sure for many of you, you had breakfast this morning. So when you eat, insulin is secreted by the pancreas to move sugar into the cells. We store the bulk of our sugar in, in our liver and our skeletal muscle. But when we exceed those storage sites, we store it as fat. When we're fasted, insulin levels are low and we can tap into fat stores for energy. Free, flexible, simple. And so when we're talking about intermittent fasting, it, it's, it's fairly simple. If you skip breakfast, if you skip breakfast in the morning, you can reduce your caloric intake by 20 to 40%. And the, the typical time frame that I recommend to my female patients is a 16-8. I'm sorry. 16 hours a day fasted yeah. with an eight hour feeding window. I, I can't skip breakfast. Yeah. I uh, we, just FYI, we don't fast. We're yeah. Not, but a lot of people do, so we like to talk about it. Yeah. We, a lot we're of not people against it necessarily. Swear by a lot of people it, swear by it. Some people are saying that it's not a good idea. Yeah. But she's saying it is a good idea, yeah. especially for women. And she's an expert, I would say, in the field. So some of the benefits. Other than fat loss. Fat loss and especially visceral fat around our abdomens, around our major organs. We know that it improves mental clarity because insulin levels are low. We know that it spikes human growth hormone, which helps us with lean muscle mass. We know that it induces something called autophagy. I will speak more about this in a second, but this is spring cleaning for the cells. It is only evoked when we are fasted, autophagy. We know that it lowers insulin levels, Blood pressure improves our cholesterol profile. And we know that it can reduce your risk for developing cancer and Alzheimer's disease, which I like to call type three diabetes. If for no other reason, we want to protect our brains. Interesting. But again, with those benefits, I feel that we see those benefits with our diet, just by eating healthy. Yeah. We see, we get mental clarity and all these. Well, so it's not just through intermittent fasting. And and I'm still not sure about the the autophagy, which she was talking about. Mm -hmm. That goes back to what we were talking about with the longevity, because that just means that your body eats old cells and cleans it up, basically, mm -hmm. since it's starving. But again, you have to be having a reduced caloric intake as well. So just because you're not eating for 16 hours, if you're shoving a bunch of bad food in your face. Yeah. <laughs> Two more clips, uh, who should avoid intermittent fasting? First and foremost, if you are a brittle diabetic or you have difficult to control diabetes, if you are a child, an adolescent, or age greater than 70, might not be the best strategy. If you are pregnant, if you have chronic heart issues, kidney or, or renal issues, not the best strategy. If you have a history of a disordered relationship with food, whether it is um, anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating, might not be the best strategy because it can invoke those tendencies. See, this and last is but not least, important. Mm -hmm. if you have a low body mass index, you're frail, or you've recently been in the hospitalized like I was for 13 days, I'm not currently intermittent fasting. See, she's not even intermittent yeah. fasting. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad that she did address, you know, people that shouldn't intermittent fast oh yeah she's yeah and she brought up a good point with uh people that have sorry relationship mm -hmm. issues with food mm -hmm. because of especially as social media it becomes like a thing you know i'm fasting here are my pictures so it becomes more of an, um, uh, an obsession mm. and you know it just exacerbates mental health issues yeah and everything else that social media helps exacerbate right. Yeah, and we, and we mentioned this. Yep. How this the, yeah, the posting of your food, the gramming, all that leads to this obsession. And what are you going to eat, you know, when you're eating and then you, now you're not eating? Hmm. Yep. And from the chat, the only reason why we're covering this, everyone's doing this. Everybody. Airman fasting. Someone brought it up at dinner last night. They yeah. Said, oh, yeah, I've been airman fasting. And last clip, a little bit of a long one. What do you eat? 
Well, when you're, when you're fasting, we know we're not eating food, but you can absolutely consume things like filtered water, plain coffee, or tea. They will not break your fast. But when you're ready to eat, what do you eat? Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention that there are foods that are going to be more advantageous for you to consume when you're ready to break your fast. So I want you to focus on real whole foods. That's what your body needs, wants, and deserves. So I want you to purchase the best quality protein that your budget permits. Ideally organic or pastured meat, wild caught fish. Healthy fats, so crucial, helpful for building healthy hormones, and also really important for satiety, making sure our taste buds light up, make us happy. I'm not part of the anti-fat brigade. Really, really important. 20 years ago, I might have told you not to eat fat, but now we know better. So I want you to focus on things like- That's so interesting. That sounds so similar to the keto mentality. Yeah. How eat all the fat you want, you're good to go, kind of thing. Continuing. Like avocados, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, and nuts. Really great healthy fats. Unprocessed carbohydrates. Ladies, absolutely crucial. If you're in perimenopause, the five to seven years before menopause, or you're in menopause, quality and quantity are crucial. So I want you to consume things like low glycemic berries, green leafy vegetables, squash, quinoa, sweet potatoes, as opposed to bread and pasta. Cautionary tale, I want you to limit sugar and alcohol. By that I mean I want you to not consume those things because they can offset all the good that you're doing. And lastly, keep yourself well hydrated. Alcohol could definitely offset a yeah. lot of things. Hey, luckily uh, cannabis doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Good old intermittent fasting. We'll still cover it. We're, we're still following it. Quinoa. Yeah, quinoa. Isn't that high in calorie? Isn't that really uh, high calories? No, Isn't that it, why we don't it's eat a it? complex carbohydrate. Or do we just not eat it because it's crap? It tastes uh, bad. It, it's okay. We just don't eat it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. For more Healthy Talk Show, please consider subscribing to our podcast over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash subscribe. It's free. Twitter and Instagram, at Healthy Talk Show, drop the W. We record the podcast live Mondays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Love and light.